Now we've covered a lot of material. Uh, in fact, uh, two talks ago, I talked about what spiritual gifts are not. Uh, that would help us define a little bit about what they are. In the previous talk, I actually outlined purposes of those gifts. I gave you uh, four things that they're not, followed by six purposes, six reasons we have them. But I didn't tell you how to discover what your gifts are. So in this talk, I'm going to do just that. I'm going to give you, hopefully, an on-ramp to self-discovery. After walking with me this far, you might already know what your gifts are. You, you may see, sense, or feel what the Lord has created you to do. If so, this talk, I think, will confirm that. If you're not there yet, though, no worries. I'll give you a paintbrush and a canvas over the next few minutes. In actuality, it's probably going to be more like a color by number. The reality is the Creator has already called forth your destiny, just like He called forth Peter's. I keep going back to Peter's story because you remember the first time Jesus called him, He spoke forth the greatness that was in him, which really, <laughs> for the next several many chapters of the Bible, when we see Peter, he looks nothing like what Jesus said that he was, but he eventually gets it. And Jesus was actually right. Well, the scripture says that God has foreordained great works that you're going to walk in. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it's by grace you're saved. And he has foreordained and empowered these great works, this destiny that you're going to walk in. So what we're looking to do here is simply discover the things that he said are true in you. And so here's what I want to do. First of all, I want to discuss three areas that will help you define your gifts. And after you see those, uh, I'm going to put together some ideas. And then after you see that, I'm going to give you five F questions, five questions that will help you evaluate your giftedness. And then after that, I'll give you a practical observation. Okay, so here it is. Three guidelines to discovery, five F questions, and then one, well, just an observation. So here it is. Three guidelines. Guideline number one, instructional obedience is look at what God has already said for you to do and then do that. So the first step in discovering your gifts is to review areas of instructional obedience. That is to look at what God has already said and then to do it. it. It's amazing how many people want to move ahead in the empowerment of the supernatural, but they haven't yet implemented the natural things that God already told them to do. So this area of instructional obedience, it creates a foundation upon which we can build ministry, upon which we can build calling, upon which we can craft and create destiny. This creates guardrails and safeguards, and it includes, I believe, two distinct areas. The first is this. Obedience includes right thinking. Now, whereas you and I tend to jump straight towards doing, the scripture cautions us to look first at what we actually believe. In John 6, 29, Jesus said, this is the work of the Father, that you not go do stuff, not yet. This is the work of the Father, that you believe. Our actions are an overflow of what we truly believe deep inside. Therefore, it's important to go back to the beginning and revisit the core issues of identity, which is really why I started this series of talks just right there. The first five lessons were all on identity. So that means to recognize that Jesus calls forth who you are well before you probably even see it, just like we saw in the life of Simon Peter. It remembers that Jesus moves you from the old line of Adam into his line. So that, that means you're, you're not now dealing with the sin nature. You're part of a new humanity. You are recreated in his image, one that's born of incorruptible seed. Now there's more, but here's why it's important that you get this one right. Because if you don't ideally deal with your issues of identity, you'll seek to fill that need for affirmation that we all have. You'll seek to fill it with externals. Uh, that, that is, you'll use your gifts to gain rather than to give so right belief, it is so important. Again, because if you don't deal with issues of identity, you're going to seek affirmation through something outside of yourself rather than the spirit that is inside of you. So obedience, it includes right thinking, but it also, second of all, includes right living. That is, the overflow of faith is action. At James 2.17, it tells us that faith without works is dead. The actual transliteration of the word dead here is unseen. That, that is, 
Belief that doesn't overflow into action, it remains invisible. That's what James is telling us. He's not saying it's non-existent. He's saying you just can't see it. So as we look at areas of instructional obedience, places where our faith remains unseen, there are two predominant questions that we need to ask ourselves about this whole area. Question number one is this. Is there an area in your life that you are afraid will catch up with you? If, if anyone knew about secret sins and hoping duplicity wouldn't catch up, it was King Solomon. Now, I discussed him in talk number 11 in that whole series where we talked about just the importance of Scripture. Solomon tells us this. He says, the righteous are as bold as a lion. He says that in Proverbs 28.1. Now, I, I've hidden my own secret sins in the past. And when I did, I was always afraid they would surface. True freedom, though, it comes not in making certain that nothing leaks out, but rather in living in such a way that there's nothing more to hide. When we hide parts of our lives, things seem fragile. We live in fear of expressing who we really are, of allowing our gifts to overflow. We're, in some sense, afraid that we'll be found out. So the solution is in the same way Peter did. You just leave behind and you live from who you are as the Christ has already called you to. You see, question number two is this. Are you harboring any areas of bitterness, jealousy, or envy? Unforgiveness not only hinders the flow of the Holy Spirit through us, it also clouds how we view other people. And that haze isn't limited to the person against whom we harbor the offense. The author of Hebrews tells us that we should beware of all bitter roots. The implication is that these roots, left unchecked, they drive deep, and then they sprout and defile not just one, but many. That's Hebrews 12, 15. Here's one of the biggest reasons, though, that the instructional obedience is foundational. Spiritual gifts don't guarantee we'll act maturely. Remember, even Judas laid hands on sick people, and they recovered. He cast out demons, yet he also betrayed Jesus. There's a graphic that I put in the show notes. It shows us that if it doesn't fall in the bounds of instructional obedience, it falls outside of the bounds of the kingdom. And again, spiritual gifts don't guarantee maturity. And since the gifts are supernatural empowerments, they're in a real sense the equivalent of handling a flaming torch to someone. And whereas fire in mature hands, it can create warmth and create helpful things. I mean, you, you can cook with fire. You can warm an entire home with fire. Fire in immature hands, it creates havoc. Earlier throughout this series of talks, many times I've referenced 1 Corinthians, one of Paul's letters. It contains one of the most robust teaching sections on the gifts that we find throughout the entire New Testament. One quick through read through the letter, though, and you discover that this church, it was burdened with massive problems. So you read things like they picked their favorite leaders and they began following those leaders instead of Christ. It's 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. Or, or the church bragged about their freedom in Christ to the extent that they boasted about a man sleeping with his father's wife. 1 Corinthians 5.1. That This would be a stepmother, but still. A church members, they settled disputes against each other by taking their brothers and sisters in Christ to court. That's 1 Corinthians 6.1. Some hired prostitutes. 1 Corinthians 6.15, as an act of cult worship, most likely. Others delved into idol worship. Look at 1 Corinthians 8.1 and 10.1. During the Lord's Supper, which for them was a potluck type of feast, some members ate all of the food before others arrived, even getting drunk during the remembrance of Christ's acts on their behalf from the communion wine. 1 Corinthians 11.18. They, they even created a supernatural hierarchy in which the gift of tongues was highlighted as a benchmark gift that others should aspire to in 1 Corinthians 14, 4 and following. Yet it's amazing that despite all of this, Corinth lacked nothing. Every spiritual gift was present according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 7. Here's what I'm getting at. Gifts don't guarantee you're living in the will of God. That begins at the more basic foundational level of expressing the written words of God in your life. So before you move forward, go back and answer the two questions mentioned in the section that I just gave you here. Make sure you're already doing the things that God said to do. Number two, natural talents and created design means we should lean into the areas that are unique 
to each of us. So this is the second of our guidelines to discovery. So after reviewing areas of instructional obedience, I, I want you to take a look at your created design. And that was a talk that I did. Oh, goodness. So let me look at my notes here. I think created design was talk number 14. Whereas the areas of instructional obedience are incredibly similar for all of us, our created design is where we begin expressing more of our individuality. So there are two questions that really they can help drive your process of discovery in this area too. So this, this would be question number three. I'm going to give you four in this talk here. Question number three uh, would be this. What is something that you do better than others? Something that you may have actually always done. In another talk episode, I told you that I've always talked and taught. It's taken various forms, but it's a common thread. When I was in high school, I helped other guys on the wrestling team learn how to better execute their moves. When, when I was in college, I helped write and create our group presentations. Now I write and teach at live events and through online courses, podcasts, and books. It's all a natural overflow of who I am and have always been even before I was saved. Now my dad's always led. His elementary teammates chose him as the captain of all their teams. His high school peers elected him to lead their student organizations, and then he led several churches. For a decade, he oversaw the Office of Leadership and Church Growth for the Baptist in Alabama. After retiring, churches continued calling him for his leadership expertise. Leadership has always been part of who he is, even before he was saved. So in, again, in talk number 14, we discuss creative design and the created gifts uh, like prophecy, service, teaching, exhorting, giving, leading, mercy, there's probably one or two that you've naturally expressed your entire life. Identifying these areas is part of discovering how the Holy Spirit expresses himself through you. Well, that leads me to another question. Question number four is this, what burden do you feel? Or what's on your heart? Sure, ministry sometimes involves doing things we don't like to do. I understand that. At the same time, Scripture tells us that we should delight ourselves in the Lord, and He will grant us the desires of our heart, Psalms 37, 4. As we align with Him and His agenda, our hearts mesh with His. As such, He places those desires, those dreams, inside of us. Now, sure, the heart can be deceitful. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that. It, it can lead us astray. Uh, if you're clinging to a hidden sin, you might not feel a burden. You'll likely find yourself mind-boggled by whatever other thing you're juggling and you're not designed to carry that. Th this is why we must first delight ourselves in the Lord. And it's why resolving those first two questions that we reviewed about instructional obedience are all the more imperative. Do you remember those questions? Uh, one of the questions was, was this. Question number one, is there an area in your life that you're afraid will catch up with you. Uh, as we set that sin aside, wh whatever it is, uh, because it's already been forgiven by, by the Lord and forgotten, you're free to move forward. And, and then as we deal with any relational issues, so question number two was, you know, are you harboring, harboring any areas of bitterness, jealousy, or envy? As, as we deal with those, we develop a humble confidence that our hearts are aligned with our fathers. Th that means that heart deception it tends to move off of us at that point because we're living free and clear before the Lord. So all of that said, question number three then is where, where's your burden? What is it that you see that other people simply often just walk past? Back, back in the Old Testament, Nehemiah felt burdened that the walls of Jerusalem sat in ruins. Her stones were scattered as rubble. The city had been in that condition for decades no one else noticed. No one cared. When Nehemiah heard of it, though, the Bible tells us he sat down and wept and mourned for days. Nehemiah 1.4, the wall became his burden. There, there's something I guarantee you that you see that very few other people see. It might be a specific cause. It might be an idea that needs to be taught. It might be some sort of ministry that you want to see implemented. It's something that the Lord has highlighted to you, part of your unique contribution to this world. 
Uh, centuries before Nehemiah, Moses became burdened for his people's freedom. And his story illustrates exactly why we don't want to simply feel the burden and then move forward acting presumptuously apart from the Lord's voice, though. We want to feel the burden, and then we want to wait for the Lord's instruction and his power to step forward. Um, for instance, one, one day, let me explain this. Moses saw a taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave. When he thought no one was looking, he secretly killed that Egyptian taskmaster and then hid the body. You can see it in Exodus 2.12. He hoped no one else would find out, but shortly after that, it became obvious that other people saw because two slaves were fighting, and he tried to stop them, and they said, are you going to kill us also? So he fled for his life in Exodus 2.15. Forty years later, the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush. The Lord called him, and he returned to Pharaoh. This time, he walked in power, and he walked in the presence of the Lord. He carried the same burden. Hey, get rid of these taskmasters. Get rid of these people who are enslaving us. But things were different. After going head-to-head -head for ten plagues, Pharaoh finally let the people go. He changed his mind, though, and then he pursued them to the Red Sea. Now, you know the end of the story. Whereas he killed one slaveholder, and fled for his life in his own strength. By leaning into the Lord's strength, Moses raised the staff over the waters, and he annihilated the entire Egyptian army. This is in Exodus 14, 28. That's the difference between carrying the burden in our own strength and carrying it in the power of the Spirit. So I, I believe the Lord highlights these burdens to us. A few years ago, maybe a decade ago, I read Ted Haggard's book, The Life-Giving Church. In that book, he recounts the story of a young worship leader who left New Life Church too soon, back when the church was running a few hundred people in attendance. I'm called to lead thousands in worship every week, the young man declared. Pastor Ted agreed with him. He encouraged the young man to continue developing his gifts. Well, that's the reason I'm leaving. I need to find a bigger church. I'm called to lead something much larger. That's not really what Pastor Ted meant. And within a few years, New Life hosted 5,000 attenders each weekend. Then the number spiked to 10,000, then 15,000. They did so with a different worship leader, the guy who had been the backup for the man who left to pursue something more grandiose. In Pastor Ted's words, someone else walked into that man's position. I believe he was called to lead thousands. The Lord placed that burden on him, but he didn't stay planted and walk in humility. After he left our church, he never found another place to lead. Scripture tells us plainly that God arranges the parts of the body just as he desires. 1 Corinthians 12, 18. If you see something in your church or around your church or in your world that needs to be done, it may very well be that God has burdened and gifted you to meet that need. That is, he might have sovereignly placed you there to express that part of the body of Christ. So your natural talents and creative design, that's part of how the Lord has uniquely made you. And in the same way, your calling will fall in the bounds of instructional obedience. The ministry you do will also fall somewhere in the bounds of that created design. Let me give you the third guidepost to, to find uh, your purpose. Um, the third one is, is this, the supernatural gifts. Um, finally, we arrive at this area. The, these are the manifestations of grace whereby the Spirit expresses himself through us. But, but remember, we, we don't just take a test, like just a fill in the blank, and then start here. We do the deeper work first. We've already answered a few questions, okay? The first questions were related to instructional obedience. The second questions were related to our natural talents and creative design. So here's, here's the questions again, just in your head, just answer these or even hit pause and then just jot down some notes. Question one, is there an area in your life that you're afraid will catch up with you? Question two, are you harboring any areas of bitterness, jealousy, or envy? Question three, what is something you do better than others, something you may have always done? And question four, what burden do you feel? So if you haven't worked through those questions, take time to do it and, and then continue moving. So 
Let me remind you that the same God who created you is the same God who gifts you. He's the God who put also those desires in your heart. And when we remember that, we find that these areas all begin overlapping and we start finding our unique place of freedom and empowerment. And I think all three overlap. Your created design, your spiritual gifts, your personal passions, they're all important. You see, that, that created design, it reveals how you were born. That, that, that is, um, it comes to you at your first birth. And then your desires, you reveal the things that you're passionate about. These passions might be based on past experience. That burden could be based on talents and skills you have or some wrong that you'd like to see made right in the world. And, and then that spiritual gift mix, it demonstrates how the Holy Spirit most effectively moves through you. These are supernatural. So these come with the second birth, that they are the presence of the Creator working, moving through you. These areas, they all work together uh, to enhance one another in a synergistic way. So as you think about it, and some of the graphics that I put in the show notes, I'd love for you to take a look at each of those. If we don't walk in biblical alignment, that is, if we don't walk in instructional obedience, then our actions fall outside the bounds of the kingdom. If we don't walk in our creative design, then we deny the individual expression that God has given us. That, that's the unique identity that he has on us. If we deny our personal passions, the ministry we do lacks heart. It doesn't connect with the soul. In, in other words, an important ingredient is missing. We weren't designed to be cookie cutters. We were created to be uniquely who he's made us to be. If we don't move in the power of the spiritual gifts, we neglect the most important, powerful force in the universe, that is, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to put a link in the show notes where you can actually download a spiritual gifts test. And I hate to call it a test because it's really not a test. It's just an assessment tool that helps you identify what you've already seen the Lord doing and working through you. Uh, in other words, the, the answers you give don't really prescribe anything. They, they really just describe what you already know to be true, helping provide language to what you've experienced. So that said, let me give you the five F questions because, again, these are five questions that are going to help you as you begin serving, run a quick check, and assess how you're doing. Uh, here they are, and then I'll talk through them each individually. Number one is faithfulness. Do I consistently show up to serve? Number two is fellowship. Do I sincerely feel like I'm following Christ when I serve in this area? Number three fruitfulness, what is the result of my service in this area? Number four, fulfillment, do I enjoy serving in this area? Number five, friends, what do others say about my service in this area? Let's walk through each of these and evaluate them very briefly. First, faithfulness, do I consistently show up to serve? My experience is that when you find the thing that God has gifted you to do, you find your purpose. And when you discover your purpose, you actually anticipate doing the work of ministry. That said, if you consistently prioritize other things, you should take that as a caution flag and evaluate yourself honestly, grappling with the question as to whether or not that particular area of service is for you. Sure, sometimes life situations dictate that you need to step back. That's different. That's a normal part of life. If you intentionally avoid ministry, though, it might be a clue that you're gifted and called to something else. Second, fellowship. Do I sincerely feel like I'm following Christ when I serve in this area? No one felt burdened to build that wall except Nehemiah. No one felt empowered to slay Goliath except David. It's not that other people weren't called to do something. They just weren't called to do those things. This loops back to the question we asked earlier about the unique burden that the Lord places on each of us. When you find your burden, you intuitively know that you're doing what he's ordained for you to do. You, you have this sense that I was made for this. Third, fruitfulness. What is the result of my service in this area? For a season, I attended a church where the lead pastor referred to himself as an apostle and his associate referred to himself as an evangelist. You might recognize those as the two equipper roles, two of the five that we see in Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. Both men were extremely honoring, full of integrity, and knew Jesus intimately. The problem is that, well, neither one of them were actually either of those roles. 
In the two years we attended the church, I witnessed zero adult baptisms. In fact, I saw four the entire time we were there. That's right, four. And three of those were the men's relatives, all children. Are these men not gifted? In my opinion, they are, but they're gifted to do something else. How do I know? There's no fruit, but there would be fruit in another area. Fourth is fulfillment. Do I enjoy serving in this area? Now, ministry isn't about you. However, when we serve others, we find an intense joy in giving from the overflow which the Lord places in us. If we don't experience that, though, we should step back, pause, and ask, is this really our area of service? Now, this is a great place to mention that we don't want to use any single question as the determining factor as to what we do or don't do service-wise. Rather, we want to hold all of these in tension, using these as ways to really discern if we're doing the thing we're created to do. Fifth is friends. What do others say about my service? The final benchmark is to seek wisdom from the body of Christ. After all, the gifts are given to each of us for the common good of all. That's what 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says. As such, we should lean into the wisdom of our brothers and sisters, what they offer us. Solomon says it clearly, as iron sharpens iron, so the countenance of one man sharpens another, Proverbs 27, 17. A countenance is a face. That is, the face of others, up close and personal, has the power to transform us into who we're designed to be. One author said it well, the person you are in five years is the sum total of the books you read, the experiences you've had, and the five people with whom you spend the most time. When I was in high school, a youth minister of mine repeatedly reminded us, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Relationships, as we've alluded to several times in this series of talks, they transform us. One of the most powerful things that you can do for your overall health is to find a group of people who will journey with you. This is true in all of life, as well as when you seek to discover your gifts and calling. Now, I don't mean a group of fans, one-way relationships with people who look up to you and endorse everything you do, nor acquaintances, that's surface-level relationships that don't have the relational weight to carry tough conversations, but rather truly deep friendships. The kind the Bible describes, the, the ones who sharpen you, like Proverbs 27, 17 says, the ones who can tell you what you don't want to hear but desperately need to hear, like Proverbs 27, 6 says, And that last one is important. I I meet people all the time who suggest that they have a group of accountability partners who walk with them. People who tell them what they need to hear. Turns out, though, they often don't. Rather, they have a group of acquaintance-ish friends who tell them what they want to hear, but won't challenge them when they need it the most. Those accountability partners confess. Yes, I, I love, insert the person's name, we're friends, But our relationship won't carry the weight of me saying, and then insert the name of some major issue where the person needs a correction or an adjustment. Often they say the friend will cut them off emotionally or relationally or argue back against them. In other words, dysfunction surfaces. That's not a true transformational support system. A support system should be designed to uphold us when we're crashing, even when we don't know we're crashing. In fact, that's when we need it the most. This means it's important to walk close with people who know you well and have the right to speak into your life. And often that entails communicating to them that you sincerely want them to challenge you, to call forth the greatness in you, even if it means correcting you and telling you the hard truths. It means they have the capacity to call forth the image of Christ that may remain as of yet unseen. You see, the reality is we all have blind spots. I used to think I didn't have any, but by their very definition, blind spots are places you cannot see. They're obvious to everyone else, particularly to the people closest to you, but they're invisible to you even as they sit in plain sight. Furthermore, and this is the glory of it, our blind spots might hide hidden dangers or they might hide hidden beauties we need to see. In other words, don't think of accountability in the negative sense only as a group of people telling us what not to do. Think of accountability as a group of people empowering us to be all that we can be. That that is, our support system may say, hey, watch out, you're not seeing this right. Or they may say, look, there's something great about you here 
that you need to see. Let me remind you of it. Blind spots then aren't necessarily negatives. Rather, blind spots are simply areas we don't see. That, that means we don't get sideswiped when others don't live up to who they really are either, uh, any more than Jesus did when Peter continued failing. We continue like Christ, calling forth the image in the mirror. That, that means we continually see that image in them and we remind them of it often before they may see it. So there are the five questions. Faithfulness, fellowship, fruitfulness, fulfillment, and friends. Well, all of this matters for one simple reason. It helps us to know where to focus our energy. That, that is, we then know what to do and what not to do. If I was 18 years old again, contemplating my post high school graduation plans, I would use the exact grid I've outlined in this talk. I would look at the areas of instructional obedience using the two questions that I provided. And then I would evaluate my creative design, answering the questions in that same section that I just gave you. Finally, I would lean into my spiritual gifts. I would let those collective answers inform the major that I chose for college, the career I selected to pursue, and even the volunteer hours that I chose to invest in my church and in my community. I can't go back. <laughs> you can't either. <laughs> the good news, though, is that it's never too late. Scripture is full of people who never executed their greatest exploits until they were in their 80s or beyond. So, young, old, wherever you are, use this as a springboard to your journey. And with that, I invite you into the show notes to the link where you can take the assessments and